Hi, I'm Frank Diamond, the managing editor of Infection Control Today, where we're helping infection preventionists and other healthcare professionals on the front lines of infection control and prevention guide America through the COVID-19 pandemic and hopefully on the better days. My guest today is Dr. Stephanie Taylor, an infection control consultant at Harvard Medical School. Decades ago, Dr. Taylor noticed how often inpatient treatment led to infection and that alarmed her. When she went back to school to get her infection control certification, she also obtained a master's in architecture. How a hospital facility or any other healthcare facility for that matter is designed and the airflow within that facility has a lot to do with infection and control. She's petitioned the World Health Organization about this issue. She wants the WHO to set guidelines around airflow and healthcare facilities. Such a petition can be an ambitious undertaking and Dr. Taylor has gotten support in her efforts from two companies, Condair and Airthings. Google, that, Google them to find out more about those companies. Dr. Taylor, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure, and um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of infection control today. I have right. been for quite a while. Great, that's, that's always nice to know. So airflow and buildings, they're so related uh, in, 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 in terms of infection and how, how infection travels. Um, is it, has there been new breakthrough studies done or, or new findings about how buildings should be laid out? So, so are there new findings about how buildings should be managed? Um, that's a very good question. And one of the things that I have found in my work is that initially the building metrics that we follow even uh, healthcare facilities as well as other commercial buildings have had more to do with how much energy is being consumed because that's a clear uh, cost for a hospital or any other building. One of the shifts that we're seeing and one of the shifts that COVID-19 has actually accelerated um, is the focus on how to manage a building to actually protect the occupant health. And so, as you mentioned, I've been working in this area now for, I don't know, 15 years, because in my medical practice, I became concerned that the building had a role in patient infections. So when I began to do research, actually using patient outcomes as a metric for the building, lo and behold, certain indoor air management strategies uh, stood out as being either protective or putting people at risk. And so there have been a couple of shifts. And thankfully, we also have some new ways of actually understanding the relationship between indoor air management and human health in hospitals, schools, medical office buildings, even in our homes. So the short answer to your question is yes, there, we definitely have some new information about how important building management is for infection control. Will it become even more important? I assume it's going to become more important with COVID-19 and people returning to their workplaces, and that's going to be a big issue, uh, airflow. Is that a fair assumption? It's a very fair assumption. And the indoor environment has always been an important component of human health. I mean, if you think about uh, the average human being spends 90% of their time indoors. So COVID-19 has really focused our attention on how a building can either protect us or not from disease. Um, so it's always been important, but people are now aware of the importance of managing the building to prevent uh, health, outcome, health problems. In your experience uh, working with infection preventionists, how cognizant are they of airflow and how much do they do about it? I mean, I guess the building is the building and there's only so much you can do about the airflow, correct or not? Well, so how much are infection prevention is aware of the importance of, of air transmission and disease processes? Um, it, that's a great question and it's also a complicated answer because I think human nature is that we want to address transmission routes that we have some control over. If you think about airborne transmission, that's probably the hardest route to control. So going back in time, not to be a historian here, but going back to the bubonic plague, you know, the, the transmission route that was assigned was 
uh, fleas from rats because you know you can see a rat, you can stop a rat. However, in 2018, those corpses were exhumed and we found that actually the pneumonic or the airborne transmission route was huge. So back to your question in the here and now, infection prevention is tend to focus on behavioral strategies for reducing transmission of uh, pathogens, you know, bacteria, viruses, you know, the, the microbes that cause disease. Right. However, there is acknowledgement that the air is important for certain diseases, measles, tuberculosis, um, influenza. However, in general, Air is, has been managed by the engineers, by the architects, by the facility managers, and not so much by the clinicians. So there is a lot you can do in indoor air management to decrease transmission of infections. And my research has, has made me focus on how we can actually intervene in controlling aerosol, aerosolization of, of uh, for example, right now, COVID-19. So there is a lot we can do, and I'll tell you what that is, if you want me to. Sure, please. <laughs> so in, in my initial studies, when I didn't really have any idea of which component of the indoor environment might uh, contribute to infections or prevent infections, um, I was really open to whatever the data was going to show me. And what has come to... Uh, what has come to light again and again and again, and sort of anti-intuitive is that when the, the air is overly dry, we actually have increased transmission of infections. And so this was a surprise to me, but since that time, uh, through further research of mine, plus many other people, we are now finding that to decrease the transmission of infections indoors, there's an optimal range of relative humidity that happens to be 40 to 60% humidity indoors that is actually optimal for human beings. Our immune system is the most robust and other organ systems as well. Our, our brains work better, for example. And, and in this range, 40 to 60%, we're also finding that pathogenic or disease causing bacteria and viruses are both less infectious and there are fewer of them in the air, in the airborne environment where we can breathe them in. So to my great surprise, 15 years ago, the, the, this zone of relative humidity uh, as being so important, um, it's beca become clear to me and again to many other people. You first got inkling of this when you were a physician you went back to school and you went and you became a certified infection preventionist. And uh, architect. Yeah, I went back to architecture school. Oh, and, that's an interesting yeah. bridge, uh, uh, infection prevention and architecture. You did it. Do you think the two fields can talk to each other now to figure out a better way to have the airflow, not only in buildings under construction, but you figure the buildings under construction, uh, hopefully the architects will know all this and account for all this, but the old buildings, the buildings that have been around for for very, very long time. How, you think the two fields need to talk to each other about that and how could they do that? I think that the that the medical profession and the building profession, whether it's architecture, engineering, facility management, we do need to be talking to each other. Do I think that's easy? No. I think it's actually quite difficult um, for several reasons. I think the more competent you are in your field, the less willing you are to uh, embrace a whole nother body of knowledge that you don't know anything about. I personally found it very difficult to go back to architecture school in my 40s um, and learn a whole new way of thinking. Well, I'm uh, to you, by the way, for doing that. That's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, thanks. It was hard and, and it was it gave me re more respect for the difficulties in different professional groups communicating with each other. And yet, if we don't, if, we've, if we ignore the impact of the environment and on indoor air specifically on our health, we're missing uh, the utilization of one of the most effective toolboxes for controlling uh, infections. It's, it's just absolutely, uh, it's exciting that we, 
we do have the ability to, to uh, manage the indoor environment. And it's, there are also are significant obstacles that mostly have to do with our um, willingness to accept new concepts. You, you mentioned environmental services. And I guess what you just said about accepting new concepts, uh, how do they fit into this and, uh, or do they? Is it just something that uh, is beyond their purview? Actually, the facility manager and housekeeping are critical to optimal patient outcomes. Um, unfortunately, sometimes I think how some of the, uh, the custodial positions are not educated about how important their work is in patient outcomes. As a physician, we weren't taught anything about the building, and I don't think that uh, building professionals are taught enough about human health. But in a hospital, for example, you know, managing, for example, filtration, managing indoor uh, humidification, managing uh, proper pressurization of patient rooms is absolutely key to whether or not that person is going to leave the hospital when they hope to and leave in a good, in good shape. So environmental services are as important, in my opinion, as a lot of the clinical medicine that we practice in, in patient settings. So infection preventionists who are on a job every day, the day to day, uh, what can they do now? Uh, what concrete steps can they do, if any, to monitor what's going on with airflow, to report if they think airflow is a problem? And how do you notice if airflow is a problem? Now you noticed it, which is why uh, you went, went back to school. Uh, you, you just dove into the data. How can somebody notice that uh, who's working day to day, uh, they just look for clues or, or what? Well, that's a good question. I mean, the first thing uh, an infection preventionist can do is to realize that the environment is critical. And in my research, we've learned that uh, low humidity in the patient room is harmful. So, as an infection preventionist, you can be you can be aware of this. You can, uh, in meetings, you can you can try to uh, inform and educate the building the building component of clinical care about the importance in this case of humidification. Um, you know, beyond that, it's hard to it's hard to know how what the role of an infection preventionist is in in managing the hospital building. But I think being aware, being educated, and, and taking, being vocal about, uh, about air, about humidification um, is, really, is really a step forward. So if you have mold, or if you have a, a humidification system or duct work that's been inactive or closed down, you don't want to turn it on and just dehumidify your air because the result will be that you will be disseminating into the breathing zone of people all of the, the, the segments of, for example, mold that can cause respiratory disease. So, need, so get rid of it. You need to, you need to mitigate the mold. And the, but during this whole process, you need to maintain that healthy 40 to 60% relative humidity. Any final words of advice for infection preventionists or other healthcare professionals uh, uh, concerning airflow and how they might be able to help mitigate problems connected with airflow where they are working? So I just, first of all, I wanna to say to all infection preventionists and, and healthcare workers, you know, thank you for everything you're doing, number one. Number two, I would say, be aware of the importance of airborne transmission of pathogens that you don't traditionally think of as being transmitted through the air. Uh, it's generally uh, an important component of disease processes. Okay, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, thank you so much for being with Infection Control today.